Hey everybody, how's it going? Let's talk about your home recording studio. Today I just want to do kind of a quick little Q&A. Uh, I've been watching guys like Warren and Glenn do their viewers comments, so I realize it's been like a year and a half since I've done a user's comment video, and I th I've only done it once, really. So uh, yeah, I, I just want to kind of focus on, on one comment here, and uh, let's take a look. So Sapel Steve had commented on, let's see, which video was this? This was on the follow-up review of the UMC 22. And I, I won't read the whole thing because we had this kind of lengthy exchange here, but the gist of his question was that he's a beginning guitarist and he's getting to the point now where he wants to record himself and just for the sake of being able to track his progress, and it, which I think is great. That, you know, it's a good idea. So he was just curious. Uh, he plays acoustic guitar and sings, and on a single track, he wants to just be able to play in front of a microphone and record that. Uh, so he was just curious uh, what type of uh, equipment he's going to need, and I and I have a feeling his question really is uh, very broadly applicable to a lot of people who are looking to get in, uh, getting into home recording. Right. Uh, one unique thing is he has a uh, much larger uh, budget potential budget at least uh, for getting started so he was talking in the five to six hundred dollar range uh, now if you've been watching my channel for a while you know that uh, yeah you can get in the door uh, for uh, even a hundred dollars uh, like with that UMC 22 and the uh, Behringer C1 microphone and you know a cheapy pair of headphones um, but if you're wanting to kind of you know take that next step and if you have the budget for it hey there's nothing wrong with buying nicer stuff you don't you don't have to buy the cheapest thing out there um the, the one benefit to buying the cheapest thing is that if your interest uh, wanes over time and the stuff just ends up collecting dust then you know you're not out much of an investment um but that being said uh, a, a nice kind of solid mid-level piece of gear uh, it's probably going to perform better and it might give you a better experience just in using it and, um, uh, you know, using it on a daily basis. So really, if you're just looking to get started, uh, you're going to need a, a few things. And I, I think I covered this in like one of my very, very first videos, like, you know, way back when. Uh, but really, you're going to need a, a few basic things, you know, besides your instrument or whatever it is you're wanting to record. Now, you're going to need a microphone of some sort. Now, in uh, Steve's uh, case here, uh, he's talking about recording ac acoustic guitar and vocal uh, performed at the same time and just capturing it uh, with a single microphone onto a single track and no mixing or anything involved. And really, you know, the requirements for that are pretty uh, slim, right? You don't need a whole lot. So you'll need a microphone of some sort. So in that kind of case for acoustic guitar and vocal, I really think a large diaphragm condenser microphone would be the right choice. Uh, they just have the qualities about them that are going to uh, very accurately be able to capture uh, an acoustic instrument like an acoustic guitar and a vocal. The next thing you're going to need is an audio interface. And when choosing an audio interface, uh, really kind of your, your two big factors are how many simultaneous inputs and outputs are you going to need? Uh, in Steve's case, he needs, you know, at least one input and an output of some sort. You got to hear what you're doing, right? So, uh, it, you know, we'll probably have, need a headphone output and probably a stereo output to go to a pair of monitors or speakers or whatever. And then also, you know, take a quick look at what types of inputs they are. Since he's wanting to record a microphone, he's going to need something that has a built-in preamp with an XLR connector with an XLR input on it. Um, if he's going to be using a the condenser microphone, he's going to need that interface to be able to provide 48 volts of phantom power. Now, while Steve could get away with just a single input, uh, you know, and, and there are interfaces out there that just have a single input, uh, you know, even the UMC-22, the UM-2, the Focusrite, uh, what is it, the Scarlet Solo, uh, I think that uh, Personas has like the I-1, is that a thing? I know they have an I-2, I'm not sure if they have an I-1. <laughs> And, and most of those have a single XLR preamp with phantom power, and any of those would do a great job. Now, the UMC-22 and the UM-2 are uh, limited to a 16-bit depth. Uh, if you're just uh, starting out and you don't really understand, you know, what's the difference between 16-bit, 24-bit, um, it, it, it's all about dynamic range. It's about the loudest loud and the quietest quiet that it can represent. And uh, with a 24-bit uh, depth on the inputs, that gives you just an enormous dynamic range. Uh, it, if you can find one that's 24-bit, uh, go for it. You know, beyond knowing the technical uh, uh, reasons behind that. Now, with a with a larger budget, 
you could start looking at devices uh, outside of that sub $100 uh, range. Uh, and you could look at things like the Steinberg UR22 Mark II and the uh, Focusrite Scarlet 2i2, uh, the second generation. Uh, you could look at the Roland Rubik's 22. I reviewed that not too long ago and I was really impressed with it. It's a good piece of hardware. Uh, Personas has the i2. There are so many uh, dual mic, uh, dual XLR input, uh, two channel, two in, two out, and two in, four out, things like that. There are so many to choose from. Really, I think the first thing you need to do is just set a budget. You know, have once you know the technical specs of, of what you're looking for and you can narrow your search uh, that way, uh, your budget is kind of the next way to be able to narrow your search. Uh, you, you know, there's no sense in spending thousands of dollars um, in, in a situation like this. Um, if this is going to be to record, just record yourself for your own listening, or if you want to show it off to a friend or two or something like that. Uh, so yeah, you, I, I have a feeling any of those kind of $150 uh, two in, two out interfaces are going to do more than enough uh, for something in a situation like this. Uh, one other thing you're going to need is some way to monitor. You got to find some way to hear yourself. Uh, the most... Uh, Obvious would be a pair of headphones, and boy, headphones come in, in so many price points uh, from so many brands, it's kind of hard to recommend any single one. Uh, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you know that I'm kind of partial to Sennheiser uh, headphones. Uh, I've been, I mainly here in this room use the, uh, let's see, what are they called? They are the HD 380 uh, from Sennheiser. I think they're a wonderful pair of headphones. I think they sound great. They're comfortable. Uh, they provide uh, ample uh, isolation so that if you're playing on top of pre-recorded tracks, something you've already recorded and you're coming back and layering over the top of that, you need to hear the tracks you recorded before uh, but you don't want the microphone you're recording into to hear that stuff. So something like the HD 380, I think they come in at $199. So they're not exactly like a uh, an entry level price point. Now Sennheiser has a very famous pair of headphones uh, that I also have, and I do love them. And they're the HD 280 Pro, and they come in at $99. Uh, you know, I just haven't used a whole lot of headphones, so I don't really feel like uh, an authority on recommending headphones. Uh, those are two that I have and that I love. But they're, you know, brands from, you know, AKG and Sony and Tascam and, oh man, too many to name. There's so many. Again, set your budget, get an idea of what you're willing to spend, and then look at things in that range. They're all going to have a great frequency response. And I think the biggest things are going to be uh, make sure they're closed back over the ear. And uh, if you can, try them out. I know that in this day and age with online shopping, it's kind of hard to try before you buy with things like this. But if you have a local, you know, guitar center or, a, you know, some audio shop or something, uh, see if you can just put them on, see if they're comfortable, see what kind of isolation they provide from the world around you. And um, if possible, see if you can, um, you know, even have somebody else wear them and turn it up kind of loud and see what kind of isolation they provide in that direction. Like how well can you hear uh, the headphones while they're on somebody else's head? That'll give you an idea of how much isolation they'll provide. So, you know, so far, so we're talking, you know, maybe 150 bucks for an interface, maybe another hundred bucks for a pair of headphones and, you know, um, in microphones, boy, mics get expensive really quick. You know, uh, I, I was really impressed with the Behringer C1 at $50. Um, and actually what I'm recording into right now, uh, it, I just got this today and I'm kind of excited to use it. Uh, here you can't really see it, but, um, here, let's see if, uh, I can give you a quick, uh, quick view of it. All right, yeah, so this is a uh, Lewitt, uh, what is it, the LCT 440 Pure. This is kind of a new microphone from Lewitt. And uh, yeah, I've been really uh, excited to uh, give this a try. I'll give this an official review here sometime. Um, this thing actually came in at $250. And I haven't, honestly, this is my first recording with it here. So I guess I'll, I'll hear how it sounds. I do have it going through a compressor. Uh, so it's going to alter how it sounds a little bit, but it came uh, very highly regarded. And uh, I, I like Lewitt as a brand. I like what they're about. Now, one thing from my conversation with Steve here, uh, he mentioned that he was wanting to use Audacity. And I, I, I totally understand because Audacity is, it's free and it's easy to use. Uh, my big problem with Audacity for anything other than just basic scratch track recording is that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't support ASIO. 
And it, so it relies, if you're using Windows, it relies on the you know, Windows WDM drivers, which are notoriously slow. Now, if you're not layering and multi-tracking, which it doesn't really sound like Steve is gonna be doing, then that's probably fine because you're not listening back to music while trying to play over it. And so that's when latency becomes a problem. It, it messes with your timing and it, it makes it really difficult to uh, play in time. It, it kind of fools you into thinking you're in time, but you're hearing things delayed. And when you listen to it back, you're, everything's you know offset from each other. It's, it, it really can be a pain. Uh, once latencies start to get uh, too high. So I think in a situation like Steve's where uh, he, he's just wanting to play into a microphone and listen back to it. Uh, honestly, you know, you could do that with a hundred dollar budget. <laughs> you know, I'm a Reaper fanboy. I, I, I really do like uh, what Reaper offers at its price point. But the reason that I like Reaper so much is because it fits how I visualize uh, uh, recording audio. It, it, it's a good fit for me. What I recommend you do is download all the free trials of all the different uh, DAW software, you know, from, uh, well, I would say Logic, but Thanks, Apple. They don't actually provide a demo. Um, but, you know, go grab Pro Tools first and go grab Studio Prime or Studio One Prime and grab Cubase and grab, um, you know, Reaper. Uh, Mix, what is it? Mixcraft. Uh, there's, um, what was the one that I hated? Uh, Traction. Uh, Traction is another free one. T5, uh, uh, Traction version 5 is totally free. Uh, personally, I hated it because, you know, for it's like the antithesis of how Reaper works. And, and I, I know for... Everybody doesn't visualize the process the same way. So it, I, I have a feeling you, you're just going to be best served by trying all of them and see which one fits the best. See which one fits you and your process and how you visualize your workflow and, and, and all that stuff. When it comes to recording into a large diaphragm condenser in an average room, uh, as you, you know, you can see behind me, I've got all my background blocked by uh, uh, my acoustic screens is that the reverberation of your room is really going to uh, have a very big influence on what your recording sounds like. And most of our rooms are reverberant. You know, we have hard surface walls. Uh, in this room, I have a hard surface floor uh, and a hard surface ceiling. So it's just an echo chamber. And so I, I really had no choice but to uh, uh, get all the acoustic treatment I can in here. And honestly, I could use even more. Uh, I've got this one behind me to uh, kill some of the reflections. Since this is a large diaphragm condenser, a one inch uh, uh, diaphragm on it, uh, it, it's going to be pretty sensitive to that. It's going to hear it. But some sort of acoustic treatment, um, you know, for vocal and and acoustic guitar, as much as I hate to admit it, um, acoustic foam will probably do an okay job of that. It, it doesn't absorb uh, the lower reflections. And, and the lower reflections, you don't really notice as much uh, in a room but your recordings will notice it. <laughs> it's just, just one of those things. But again, he's not layering track upon track upon track, so that, that low-end reverberation is probably not gonna uh, have a chance to accumulate in a mix or anything, so yeah, it's probably okay. But I, uh, honestly, um, investing in some sort of way, whether it's acoustic foam, whether it's uh, some broadband absorption, uh, whether it's a, a heavy uh, comforter or, or something like that, a moving blanket. And, and it gets really kind of undersold as, a, as an important part of, of recording in a room. You're dealing with a very sensitive microphone. Uh, it's going to hear reverberation in the room even better than you can. And especially if you want to start playing with effects like compression and compression is going to exaggerate that uh, the ambient sound in the room. Uh, so, you know, you'll probably be better off, you know, killing as many of those reflections as possible, unless you happen to live in just a beautiful sounding room. Maybe you have a giant uh, room in your house that really has a pleasant reverberation to it. And, you know, in that case, sure, you know, take advantage of that. Make that part of the sound of your recording. Uh, but for most of us in small rooms, bedrooms, offices, uh, basements and garages and, and things like that, um, you know, it, it, the reverberation in those spaces doesn't sound all that great. So it's kind of better just to kill it. <laughs> All right, now I guess there are a few other considerations and these do dig into your budget a little bit, but basically the accessories. You need cabling to, to plug everything in. So you're gonna need a cable between your mic and your interface. You're gonna need cables between your interface and your speakers. Uh, other accessories like a microphone stand. Uh, if you're, and if you're gonna be close to a microphone while singing, uh, these microphones are very sensitive to breath, to the movement of air. And so when you do things like 
you know, a P or a B or an S or a T. Um, and you just kind of create little puffs of air with your, with your mouth. Uh, these diaphragms are very sensitive to that if you're if you're very close to them at all, and it'll come through as a very low frequency boom uh, whenever a puff of air hits the the diaphragm. So uh, a pop filter is a is a good idea to invest in one of those if you're going to sing anywhere close to a mic. All right, I think I've jabbered on long enough. See, this is this is why I don't do these videos very often. Um, you know, I can spend all this time talking about one single question. Imagine if I tried to, you know, do like Glenn Fricker and, you know, the address five or 10, uh, these videos would be two hours long. So, all right, I've jabbered enough for right now. I hope this has been at least a little bit helpful. I, I hope some, some newcomers see this and, and I hope it helps kind of, you know, demystify getting started and what you're going to need to get started recording audio at home. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. I'll see you all next time.